Thank you, Pear, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I should first explain that the airline lost my suitcase, and in it were my shorts and T-shirt. <laughs> so this is si no sign of disrespect to the people of Oslo. So first of all, the context for my talk today is uh, similar to Miriam's. It's the, the big questions of biodiversity depletions and climate change. Yes, we have a problem. I don't believe that the solution to this problem is contained in the logic of sustainability. So that's my first point. I believe that it's presumptuous because it talks about sustaining and I think that means sustaining through time, it doesn't actually say who sustains what um, and when. And so although the principle behind it was a good one at one time, I think it's confused us and delayed us. So what is the problem? Usually within the discourse of sustainability, we think in terms of resources. I think that's correct. Are we running out of resources? I don't believe so. In fact, I think we're running out of imagination. And in, indeed, one of, the, one of the problems of the paradigm that we're living in is that design has shaped this. So this is my particular background uh, professionally. How can we redesign the process by which we reduce our consumption? That's the normal way we see it. But habits are promoted by beliefs and assumptions and those are contained in language. So what I'm proposing today is that we have a very long-term backlog of assumptions that go back a long way and that we live through these assumptions in our language and discourse that shapes the idea of sustainability. So the reality that we see, in other words, the paradigm itself is invisible to us because it's normal. It's what we see every day and what everybody does. Um, we, we ship plastics around and we allow them to drop into the water, and this is, this is a normal process. And some of this, I think you could say, goes back to some of the mathematicians um, who confused um, numbers with reality, and also with people like Plato, bless him, um, who was so keen on, um, actually, industrial throughput. This, his theory of form I believe was based on, on a kind of early production system that is similar to, to Henry Ford's uh, production system. Um, and this led us to a belief in the West, at least, that nothingness is something to be feared or despised. And so we have a, a paradigm that needs to be, where bits and pieces need to be drawn together. We, we've, through people like Aristotle, we've, we've kind of separated things into categories, so we have choices, and we have a choice-based paradigm of consumption. That really is doing us no good, as the last uh, video just showed us. How can we join these processes up? And in Plato's world, um, what he surmised was that there was something very magical and special about what lies underneath the things in front of us. So if we, if we see those things in front of us that we like, um, this, this doesn't really fit in very well because it's the world of the actual, not the re what he called the real world. We might call it the virtual world. And the virtual world is kind of neater. It's tidier. The virtual world is something that we can measure more easily. And it's something in which we, we can exchange more easily. It's the, it's the purity of mathematics. So what this led to was an assumption, and I'll, and I'll just run through, I know that we're talking about plenty today, um, but the word I like is abundance. And obviously, in, in this sense, um, the more oil we have, um, Oslo has lo lots of oil and lots of, uh, lots of money too, by the sound of things. Um, so that's... That's fantastic. Th this is what we mean by abundance, isn't it? I don't believe so. I, I, I think this is absolutely the wrong way to see it. Um, what I would suggest is that we only get abundance by combining different things. So difference, once, assuming we don't get um, thorium-based energy supply to keep us back on the track that we want to sustain, um, we, we will need to see the energy prices matched by a diversification uh, where difference is most important to business policy and therefore 
Diversity is extremely important. That means we can have things worked on a local scale and instead of the mobility-based society that we have. So just to compare my background in design, I would say it, the original paradigm of design is based on imagining something in the future and then attaining, attaining that goal. And that's fine. If you're designing a cup or something specific, a form, the kind of platonic form, that's relatively easy because we know how to do that. We've been doing it for a long time. But design is part of the problem. And we can't, re we can't solve the problem by using the existing logic um, that, we, that created the problem, as Einstein said. So meta design is a way to redesign design because designers are certainly part of the problem. Since about the 1880s, we've, they, we've trained them to become catalysts to economic growth, GDP. So my proposal is that we work to a combinatorial approach rather than a, pro a discrete project, products or uh, services approach in which we look for relations between things. So we focus on the interactions and the relations so instead of sustainability, we might have co-sustainment, because that's how the ecosystem works. Um, and indeed, once you produce a combination that is efficacious, it produces abundance, then you can also take that abundance and combine it with something else. It doesn't matter what you combine, as long as there is a difference between them. And now, this is a very different paradigm from that of the economies of scale arguments that we've learned through fa the factory system. Not all combinations produce a synergy, but here's a good example of a synergy where we take a poison, inedible poison, and another inedible poison, and we combine them in the right way, sodium and chlorine, and we get salt, um, which is edible, and it tastes different from either. So... <laughs> So the synergy, in a way, I think everybody understands the term synergy, which uh, I give you another example of a synergy, which is a, a very different one. Synergies are so abundant that we, don't, we take them for granted. This is one of the problems. It's one of the problems of understanding how to work with it. Stainless steel is 35%, up to 35% stronger than any of its ingredient parts. Now that means that in sustainability terms, it's 35% stronger, so we, we need 35% less or even more than that, we can improve on that. Uh, if we go to uh, the, let's say, how one would work with the forms um, circle, using stainless steel in a tensile way is far stronger than in a compressive way. So the bicycle wheel, this is a giant bicycle wheel in London. And, <laughs> we, okay, so the benefits from this create enormous abundances because we, we've synergized synergies in order to, uh, bring forms and materials together in, a, in another synergy way. And you could take this further because, it's a, a, as I said, it's a kind of bicycle wheel. And if you combine it with a rider and possibly a nice flat road, then you get the most efficient energy system on the planet. Uh, bicycle wheels can take the, the strain of t uh, 700 times its own weight. So these are extraordinary challenges that synergy uh, encompasses. Okay, we could then synergize anything. It, it's possible. We, in fact, we should, in my opinion. We should really try to step back and see the world not as a set of bits, chemical, uh, chemicals and technical fixes and gadgets and so on, which is what the platonic paradigm led us to, but we should join up different things in, in this kind of way. Okay, so that's going to lead us to many different uh, solutions, many different abundances across the whole system. And in, and in this case, we have eight starting points. We've just chosen eight things, and we will get then 28, um, a minimum of 28 synergies from that, and then we can synergize those. The problem with this, if we're using it in the methodologies of human beings and human brains, is that those 28 relations rather exceeds what our poor brains are good at. Um, this is fairly recent brain research um, that tells us that maybe we, we're quite good at dealing with four interdependent things at once. Um, beyond that, we get a bit shaky. So, my solution then is to think on a very pragmatic basis in terms of a quartet. Now, that quartet 
sounds like for human beings. Um, I will describe it in those terms, but it could be for anything. It could be for causes or for problems. It could even be problems. You, you can combine problems and create synergies. But this is some interesting mathematics um, that you get six times more abundance from a quartet than from a duet. How come? I got 8% I got eight for maths at school, so I, I'm the wrong person really to, to prove this, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, if you start with a duet, let's say we've got, we've got two people um, and they work together and they, they pr each produces something, uh, maybe a sound on a violin, um, and then we get a synergy from them, something that combines the two. So we have then three things. So we have one synergy from two inputs. How many, how can we get then, if you double the numbers, how do you get six? That's a six-fold increase, that's quite good, isn't it? Um, it's very simple, if you d show it in a diagram form, you have the second duet, and so therefore you've got two synergies, and then of course, once they start to interrelate, you find that there are four more. So it's very simple mathematics, and one of the problems of designing for synergy, or looking for synergies, or orchestrating synergies, is that Again, if you have a lack of synergy within a team, you're going to lack the um, efficacy to find synergies. So in a team of eight, let's say, how, many, how much influence does one of those team members have? Because if one person is determined to have a bad day for everybody, they, how much influence would they have? And I make it 25%. In a team of four, how, mu how much would that be? My mathematics says it's half. So already this is sounding slightly weird mathematically because we're looking at synergies, we're focusing on the interactions rather than the numbers, the things, the people. How many would it be if one has a team of two? Any ideas? Okay, two thirds in a team of three and I make it 100% in a team of two. Um, we, we may have to talk this through later on over a glass of wine, um, <laughs> if, you, if you disagree with me. But just to give you an example, um, a practical example, I've been staying opposite in, in a wonderful hotel, um, which I would say is a fantastic duet. Um, it's a synergy caused by, bringing, by looking for an affordable hotel with people who have work problems, who are getting out of unemployment and have problems. Um, so there's a duet, and so you have a fantastic synergy. Um, <coughs> Supposing you added to that synergy two other concepts brought together. So supposing, for example, you, you have a, a computer company that, that, that is looking for people to help them, so you, or a communication system. We would then have six times the amount of synergies coming from that whole system. So what we need to do, ladies and gentlemen, is to think about this, because I think governments really haven't got this... Uh, right yet. A lot of the methods of uh, legislation and organization are quite secondary, they're quite uh, indirect, and what we need is direct lifestyles-based design thinking. And actually, everybody's doing this. The TED process already is on track, um, and Rick's uh, pirate project, fantastic. So we, we can all work towards uh, making this happen by simply meeting and forming duets and then eventually looking for quartets that can be synergizing and producing up to six different synergies out of those things. Thank you very much. Back, back. <laughs>